Well, it's Easter Sunday, uh, and He is risen. Uh, that is why we have gathered to celebrate. Um, and so uh, Friday happened, uh, and we call it Good Friday. And the only reason that we call it Good Friday, because uh, to be quite honest, there's nothing really good about it on face value. But, but if we put on our kingdom glasses and we're able to see beyond the physical, then we can see that it is a Good Friday. Because uh, Jesus died on the cross, but three days later he rose from the grave. And, and that is today. That is why we celebrate today, that, because he is risen. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my interpretation of Easter Sunday, one that is found in uh, John chapter 20. I read through uh, this chapter and I thought, listen, let me, let me give you my interpretation of it. It's very similar, uh, but just to, to, to get everybody on the same page of where we are this morning in history. And so we're told that at the break of dawn, on Sunday, in the midst of darkness, Mary Magdalene arrived at the tomb only to discover that the stone blocking the entrance had been mysteriously moved aside. She ran off to find Simon, Peter, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Mary shouted, they have taken the body of the Lord out of the tomb, and we have no idea where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple, this is John, who apparently talks about himself in the third person, they embarked on a journey towards the tomb, both of them running, but the other disciple, John, managed to outrun Peter and reach the tomb first. He bent down and looked inside, catching sight of the linen wrappings resting there. However, he chose not to enter. Simon Peter shortly arrived and wasted no time by entering the space, a clear indication that speed does not always mean brave. He couldn't help but notice the linen wrappings nearby with the cloth that had covered Jesus' head neatly folded and separated from the rest. This cries out, hashtag, I'll be back. Jesus then appears to Mary Magdalene. Mary, Mary stood outside the tomb, tears pouring down her face. With a heavy heart, she bent down and looked inside. She saw two white-robed angels, one positioned at the head and the other at the foot of the spot where Jesus' body had rested. The angels asked, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she responded, her voice filled with trembling uncertainty. I have no idea where they have put him. The angels look to one another and they say, why is she looking for the living among the dead? As she prepared to leave, heart heavy, mind spinning, a figure caught her eye standing in her path. She failed to recognize that it was indeed Jesus. Excuse me, dear woman, may I ask why are you in tears? Jesus asked, who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, in desperation she pleaded, please, if you have taken him, just let me know where he is. And then she utters these words, I will do whatever it takes to find him. Jesus called out, Mary, Mary, in that split moment, she knew who was standing in front of her. A familiar voice. A voice that calms the raging seas. A, a voice that calls the dead to rise. A voice that heals the sick. A voice that grants forgiveness. A voice that calls out the wicked. A voice that comforts the afflicted. A voice that gives hope to the hopeless. All yes and true. But to her, this was a voice that had become home. With tears streaming down her face, she looked at him and cried out, Raboni! A word that held deep meaning, signifying her recognition of him as her beloved teacher. Afraid to lose him again, she takes hold of him. Please do not hold on to me, Jesus replied. 
as I have not yet ascended to the Father. Please find my brothers and tell them that I will be ascending to my Father and your Father. Mary thinks for a moment. I'm still in the family. Jesus goes on to say, to my God and your God. With the surety of her place in the kingdom of God, Mary Magdalene rushed to find the disciples. Her voice filled with excitement as she declared, I have seen the Lord. He is risen. She then delivered his message to them. And then friends, for the next 2,000 years, his message has been delivered all across the world. From continent to continent, from country to country, from context to context, and still today, this message is being delivered. He is risen. Now, you might be sitting here going, on a great introduction, but we do this every year. We celebrate every year. Every year we gather and we make much of Jesus and his resurrection. But, but, but why? Maybe, maybe this is your second Easter Sunday as a believer, as a child of God. Maybe this is your 20th Easter Sunday. Why? Why do we keep doing this year after year? And how do we make sure that it never becomes too familiar? See, I believe that's a great question to ask. Because this ne- can never become too familiar. We should never normalize this. We, we should live in such a way that we never get over Jesus and his resurrection. And so here's what I want to do this morning, and I'll be as quick as I can, is I want to give you seven reasons, seven reasons why we celebrate Easter Sunday, seven reasons why we gather year after year after year to celebrate, to make much of Jesus and his resurrection, seven reasons. If you have a pen, I'd encourage you to write them down. Reason number one. Reason reason number one is that the resurrection points to to the trustworthiness of the Bible. The, The resurrection points to the trustworthiness of the Bible. You see, the resurrection of Jesus affirms the trustworthiness of the Bible as mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 4. It says this, I passed on to you what was most important. Other translations say that which is of first importance. So they are important things that you should know. And we talk about them every Sunday. But, but on this Sunday, we're going, no, 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 there is something that is of first importance. I passed on to you what is most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. Friends, there is, there is so much historical proof that a man named Jesus lived and walked the earth. There are so many eyewitnesses, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds, who, who saw his miracles and, hear this, his resurrection. And, and all of this is, is evidence It points to the fact that we can trust the scriptures, that we can trust the Bible, that it is dependable, that we can believe what it says and what it says about Jesus. I could talk about the the, the tons of historians and those who aren't even Christians who affirm that Jesus lived. And they affirm that he did all the things that he did. They just can't get around it, but, but still they cannot surrender their lives to Jesus. I could talk about all those things, but here's where I want to focus our attention. I want us to go to to the the fulfillment of the many prophecies regarding Jesus' death and resurrection. And they solidify, they solidify the credibility and the genuineness of the scriptures. All these prophecies that 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 prophesied about, about a Messiah who would come to live the life we should have lived and died the death that we deserve and rose from the grave. I I mean, I We could go to Isaiah 53, the the well-known messianic prophecy known as the suffering servant prophecy. It it details the death of Jesus for the sins of humanity more than 700 years before Jesus was even born. 
Isaiah provides details of his life and death. Isaiah tells us that, that this Messiah was rejected. He, he tells us that this Messiah was killed as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. He tells us that this Messiah was silent in front of his accusers. All of this happened. Isaiah tells us that this Messiah was buried with the rich, which meant that he, he was buried in a tomb which belonged to a rich man, a borrowed tomb. Why was it borrowed? Because three days later, he would give it back. Isaiah tells us of a Messiah that, that would be we put among criminals in his death, that he, he, he was hung and beside, on each side were, were criminals. Messiah, Isaiah prophesied all of these things about our Messiah. And can you imagine, I mean, the Bible doesn't say this, and so this is, this is my imagination, but can you imagine in heaven as these things are happening, pe people are tapping Isaiah and going, bro, you wrote this. <laughs> he, he'd be like that guy. Ever watched a movie with someone who's watched it before? <laughs> it's, the, it's the worst. It's like you're watching it, you, you're, you're like in it, and then there's someone there going, and he's about to die. Oh, and he's about to get the guy. You're just like, hey, I know, it. calm down. But that's Isaiah. He's just going, I wrote this. In fact, after prophesying that the suffering servant of God would suffer for the sins of the world, Isaiah then says that he would then be cut off from the land of the living. Doesn't get more specific than that. But, oh, but, Isaiah then says, he, this is Jesus, will see his offspring. Who are his offspring? Well, it's all of us who benefit from his death and his resurrection. It's for all of us who believe somehow in some strange way that it counted for me. Then we are told in Isaiah 53 that God the Father will prolong his days. Isaiah is speaking of a living Savior. Despite what the world may think, Jesus is not dead. He is very much alive. Isaiah 53 verse 11 says this, and after his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. This is speaking of a risen Savior. Jesus' resurrection from the grave is also predicted by the prophetic words of King David. You can read about it in Psalm 16 verse 10, but, but I want to take you to Psalm 22. Again, David writes about the resurrection of Jesus. In verses 19 to 21, the suffering Savior prays for deliverance. He says, from the lion's mouth, a metaphor of Satan. And then this desperate prayer is then followed immediately in verses 22 to 24 by a hymn of praise in which the Messiah thanks God for hearing his prayer and delivering him. Friends, all of the Old Testament can be summarized as events prophesying, pointing to Jesus. Amen. His life and his resurrection. It can be summarized in that this is about Jesus who lived and died and rose again. In fact, even Jesus himself affirms this. I'll, let me look, Luke chapter 24. I'll, let me read this. From verse 13, it says, Now, that same day, this is after Jesus' resurrection. Now, that same day, two of them, this is two of Jesus', his disciples, were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Don't you just love that? Seven? We don't have time. <laughs> Together, they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you are having with each other as you are walking. So you're like, what are you guys talking about? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. Uh, the one named Cleopas uh, answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? Right? It's like, where, where have you been? Who are you? It's almost like you are not from this world. No, not yet? Okay, no problem. <laughs> Verse 19, what things? He asked them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things 
happened. Oh, so I'm glad they were listening. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, gosh, I love Jesus, how foolish you are. There's an honor translation, but I won't say that uh, this morning. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What prophets? Well, the prophets of the Old Testament. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Verse 27, here's where it is. Then beginning with Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Jesus goes, you know what? Let's just have a Bible study real quick. And let me quickly show you that everything that you have read and everything that you have believed in is about me. That in that moment, he's going, hey guys, remember David? You're not David. That's a message for us. You're not Moses. You're not Ruth. That all, all of this is pointing to my life and my death and my resurrection. Friends, this tells us that this, this book, this book may possess old and ancient words, but they are very much alive. They are breathing and moving, saving and transforming as they point us to Jesus, our Savior King. So that's point number one, the resurrection points to the credibility of, of the Bible. Here's point number two that we, we celebrate Easter. The, the resurrection secures the forgiveness of our sins. Another way to say it is our, our debt is paid. Acts chapter two, verse 36 to 38 says, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. He is both Lord and Messiah. He is Lord and Savior. Some of us, we, we think we can pick. Now I want Jesus as my Savior, but not as my Lord. How scary is the other side? Is no, 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 he's my Lord, but, but I don't know if he really saved me. Verse 37, Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? What is our response to this? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus' resurrection is not only a demonstration of his divine authority, but also a promise that our sins are forgiven. His ultimate sacrifice paid the price for our sins. This is why the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 9, according to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. See, his resurrection symbolizes the acceptance of that sacrifice. That's what it does. It symbolizes the acceptance of that sacrifice, that that, that, that blood was enough. It was enough because if it was not, Jesus would still be in the tomb today. The resurrection secures the forgiveness of our sins. Number three, the resurrection affirms our new birth in Jesus. The resurrection affirms our new birth in Jesus. First Peter uh, chapter one, verse three and four says this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You see, this historical event is, is a symbol that we, that is you and me, can experience spiritual rebirth and renewal. That it's, it's available, it's possible. It serves as a, a beacon of hope that, that life can triumph over death. That, it, that, it, that love can overcome hate. That renewal, hear me, that renewal or, or rebirth is always, 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 always possible. I know many of us, we, we go, off, maybe for someone else, but, but God, you don't know the things that I have done. 
Well, I'm here to tell you that he does. Spoiler alert. He does. And still he makes the invitation. But maybe you're going, but, but, okay, but you don't know the things that have been done to me. That maybe you feel that I'm, I am so damaged, I, I am so broken, I am so battered, I am so bruised, that I am not worthy of his love. I want to tell you that he was battered, that he was broken, that he was bruised, so that you might be able to receive new life. It is always, always, always possible. But, but Peter continues to write, verse 4, and into an inheritance, come on, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So not only is the debt paid, but in this new life, credit is granted. I mean, it's like going to the bank and then speaking to the bank manager and going, you know what, things are really, really bad. Things are bad. I have, I have no money to pay my debts. I just, I just want to be upfront with you. I've tried. I've tried everything. I've gone to the loan sharks. Please don't go to loan sharks. <laughs> like, if you, if you need to speak to someone, we're here for you. Don't go to loan sharks. But I've gone, I've, like, I've gone to all the, I've, I have nothing. And so the bank manager goes, okay, I see you know what? We're going to write off this debt. You owe us nothing. Now you would, I hope, would walk out of that bank like just screaming with joy. But, but here's the thing. You have nothing. Right? You have, you have nothing. See, what the gospel does, it goes, no, 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 no. We're not just sending you out the bank with a debt that has been paid. We're sending you out the bank with credit, and this credit is way more than the money that we have in our hands and in our pockets. I said this a couple of weeks ago, it's gonna become my thing. The only thing that we can take to heaven is people. Some of us think, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my cash, and I'm gonna take my credentials, and I'm gonna take my comforts with me. You know what happens? I, I believe you're gonna get to heaven, and you're gonna be like, you know, hey, angels, look at all this money that I have, and they're gonna look at you and be like, yeah, over here, we just call that trees. It's really cool. It's like Monopoly money up here. You can play with it if you want. No, friends, what, what we are credited with is what Paul writes in Ephesians 1 when he talks about every spiritual blessing has been given to us from heaven. Oh, and, and, and one of the, the saddest things, I believe, is for a child of God to go, I have been forgiven, but not to live in the fullness of the newness of life that you have in Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Romans 6 says this, have you forgotten? I hope you haven't. I hope you haven't. H have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we were joined, we joined him in his death for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we, now we also may live new lives. So go live new lives. Go live new lives. Friends, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ offers a profound interpretation of his sacrificial death. It symbolizes not only the end of Jesus' earthly life, but also the birth of a new spiritual life for all who trust and believe in Jesus for salvation. Yes. This is why Friday is good. And we can say Friday is good because Sunday is coming. His death and resurrection represent a, a path to salvation and redemption, a path to the abundant life. And this abundant life is, is not just for the next life. Yes and amen. But this abundant life is for now here today. Amen. That in this very moment, you can leave from this place with the abundant life. But the question is, will you surrender your life to Jesus? Point number four. Our fears are conquered through the resurrection. Our fears are conquered through the resurrection. Why? Because power is granted. 
So not only is credit granted, but power is granted. The, the resurrection of Jesus Christ defeats our fears. Matthew 28, verse 5 and 6. Let me, let me read from verse 1. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes was white as snow. Hear this. The gods were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. What does fear do? It makes you become like a dead person. The angel told the woman, don't be afraid. He doesn't say that to the gods, but he says it to the women. Don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Friends, the, the resurrection of Christ stirs fear in those who follow a path of sin. It's what it does. Now, I know you might be reading this and be going, oh, on air. I think that the fear that they had was because these angels, I mean, I know we have these little cute little baby with a halo and like, you take that out of your mind. That's not, that's not an angel. I mean, it's, it's a frightful thing to stand before an angel. So yes, that, that, I think that's a realization, but, but something deep is happening here. Don't miss it. And I believe something deep is happening here because of what they say. Don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. It doesn't say, don't be afraid. Doesn't, uh, don't be afraid of me. I'm not, it doesn't say, he's like, no, 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 I know. I know the fear that grips you. And so the resurrection of Christ stirs fear in those who follow a path of sin while providing comfort for those who are the children of God. It serves as evidence of the resurrection for both groups, one leading to guilt and shame and everlasting judgment, and the other to eternal glory, peace, and joy. But the resurrection conquers, it, it conquers our fears. And what is our greatest fear? Death. It is the one thing as humanity that we cannot get our hands around. We have come up with the greatest of inventions. Technology upon technology upon technology, but, but we can't. No amount of anti-aging cream. You can do as many sessions as you want in the gym. But, but, but the stats for the death rate is 100%. It is, the, it is the one thing that, that, that grips us, that like, we're, we're so overwhelmed by it, not just our own death, but the death of our loved ones. And yet we're told that the resurrection conquers that fear. See, the, the resurrection of Jesus shows us that even death, even death, our, our ultimate fear has been conquered. And because of this, we can, we can live our lives in faith and not in fear knowing that our, our very next step is secure in Christ. Imagine we lived like that. Church, imagine we lived like that. That every step we take where we live, work, and play, no, we do it in faith and not in fear. You know, the enemy, the enemy of faith is fear. It's not doubt. Bring your doubts to Jesus. The enemy of faith is fear. Fear is not an emotion, friends. Fear is a spirit. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of, but one of, but one of, you got to say it like you believe it, but one of, guys, imagine, imagine, imagine we believed this. I believe our prayers would move from God. Would you please find me a nice parking space? Right, God, I, I pray that today would not rain because I want to play in the sun. With, like, our prayers would be on the next level. God, would you move in a powerful and profound way through our government? We have nothing to fear. The rest of the world does. 
But the church stands because we go, you know what? The resurrection conquered our greatest fear. Jesus is a conquering savior. He conquered sin at the cross and he conquered death at the tomb. Number five, the resurrection provides us with not just a helper, but the helper who is the Holy Spirit. John 16 verse seven says this, nevertheless, this is Jesus talking, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage. Huh? I, if Jesus says that, you, you go, okay, what is, what, what, is, what is the advantage? It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The, the Christian Standard Bible calls him the counselor. The living, New Living Translation calls him the advocate. The, the Young Literal Translation calls him the comforter. Friends, he, he is all these things and so much more. And so much more. He, he is the convictor of sin. Have you, have you ever, like if you're a child of God and you're walking in Christ, have you ever felt that like nudge when you, when you feel tempted or when you're in sin? That, that's not bad lunch. That's the Holy Spirit convicting you of your sin. He, he's calling you away from that, that which will destroy you. He, he is God's seal on his people. He, he, his claim over us. He is our guide. So let him lead. He is our intercessor. Ever prayed and just gone, I, I don't have words anymore. But yet still something happens. That's the Holy Spirit. He is our teacher, so let him instruct us. See, the, the Holy Spirit given to us through the resurrection is a constant reminder of Christ's presence in our lives and he's promised to never leave us. Number six, got two more. The resurrection is our guarantee of eternal life. The, the resurrection is our guarantee of eternal life. You see, there's a lot of places, a lot of companies and businesses and retailers who offer guarantees and warranties for their products and their services. And some of them even offer lifetime warranties. See, a lifetime warranty is a, a guarantee that a manufacturer will repair or replace any defective parts for their products and that this will come at no additional cost. That's what it is. I want you to know that God offers not just a lifetime warranty, but an eternal one through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus. But I think it's important for us to ask the question, when does it make sense for a retailer to offer a lifetime warranty? Seems ridiculous. Because we know things over time, they break down. So why would anybody do that? What are the things that a, that, that, that a, a, a manufacturer must think through in order to offer a lifetime warranty? Well, let me give you four. One is that they must believe in the quality of their products. I want you to know that God believes in the quality of the gospel. That is why he can offer us an eternal guarantee. He believes in the finished work of his son, Jesus. Here's another one. A, a manufacturer must be able to make repairs or replacements. Well, I want you to know that the power of the gospel provides sanctification, this idea of being set apart to be transformed, that God is molding you and shaping you to become more and more like his son, Jesus, that, that he is healing and restoring you. And all of this is through the work of the Spirit. So, so God goes, no problem. You are a work in progress, no problem. The manufacturer must, must price appropriately what is going to be repaired. He must take it into consideration how much it will cost him. Well, God knew. God knew. It's a word that we've used here before, propitiation, which simply means a payment that satisfies. Paid in full by the blood of Jesus. God is very, very much aware of how much it cost. It cost him his son. And the manufacturer, they, they must define this phrase, lifetime warranty, in a way that works for them. Well, we can define it as to die, which means it is finished. That's how God defines it. It's, a, it's an eternal guarantee because it is finished. What's finished? 
the work that Jesus came to do, to carry the sin of the world, to have the wrath of God poured out on him. It is finished. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus, our high priest, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 to 21 says this, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, as the first fruits, the first fruits, Fruits, this word in, in Greek is, is apage, apage, which kind of sounds like a pate, which is what I believe the church does in recognition of what Jesus has done. It's time to party because he, Jesus, is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep, which simply means that he is the promise of more to come. For since death came through, Amen. The resurrection of the dead also comes through. Amen. I got one more. One more reason on why we celebrate Easter Sunday. And that is the, the resurrection is a preview of our future, which makes us steadfast and immovable in the present. The resurrection is a preview of our future, which makes us steadfast and immovable in the present. F F Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. To 21 says this, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not our home, friends. And some of us need to stop living as if it is. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. See, the resurrection gives us a glimpse of what is to come. A life free from pain, free from sorrow, and free from death. We, we are promised a future transformation just as Jesus was transformed through his resurrection. Oh, friends, you need to hear this. See, the, tra the transformation, here's what it'll do. The, the transformation will take us from alienation to belonging, from poverty to provision, from unqualified to qualified, from curses to blessings, from need to abundance, from sorrow to joy, from torment to tenderness, from depression to praise, from discontent to satisfaction, from unrighteousness to righteousness, from unclean to clean, from slavery to liberation, from captive to released, from bondage to freedom. And then you might go, those last three sound the same. Well, some evil spirits need to be called out by every single name. From drifter to resident, from chaos to order, from lies to truth, from domination to dominion, from darkness to light, from brokenness to wholeness, from orphan to child to heir, from shame to glory. And if this is true, and it is, then we should be steadfast and immovable in this present world. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56 to 58 says this, and I'll close on this, the, the, the sting of death is sin. The sting of death is sin and, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The sting of death is sin. Um, our, our eldest daughter has a love-hate relationship with bees. To be specific, honeybees. And I believe that if you want to conquer some of your fears, you need to know your enemy. And so uh, one day she had to do a school uh, assignment where she had to give a speech on any topic. And we said, well, why don't you do one on the honeybee? Let's get to know our enemy. And so we learned a ton of facts about the honeybee and, and very interesting. And one of them is that, did you know that a honeybee cannot sting you twice? Some of you know where I'm going with this. You see, when the honeybee stings you, the stinger ruptures its insides. And as it tries to get away, it pulls its entire intestines with it, leading to its inevitable death. A honeybee cannot sting you twice. 
You see, on the cross, the honeybee of death stung our Lord and Savior because he carried the sins of the world. But before he breathed his last breath, he pushed up on his nail, pierced hands and cried, it is finished. He was then brought down from the cross and he was laid in a tomb. But three days later, three days later, he rose from the grave, putting death to death. And so for those who are in Christ, for those who surrender their lives to Jesus, you need to know that death cannot sting you again. It may take you physically, but it cannot touch you spiritually. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Oh, death, where is your sting? Hal, where is your victory? See, with the knowledge of Christ's resurrection, we can face any challenges with courage and perseverance. We are reminded that nothing in this world can separate us from the love of Christ, not even death itself. And so why do we celebrate the resurrection every year? Well, simply put, because we are in awe. We are in awe. We are in awe of its implications on our lives. This is why Paul says in in Philippians, he says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, so that one way or another, he's going, I, I don't care what Jesus calls me to do, because one way or the other, I, I, I want to experience the resurrection from the dead. Friends, There's an American novelist called Ernest Hemingway. He wrote a captivating short story titled The Capital of the World. Hemingway masterfully weaves a tale that centers around the relationship between a father and his teenage son. A son's betrayal shattered the bond with his father, forcing him to run away in shame. The father tirelessly searched every corner of Spain in his desperate quest to find his son. Yet his efforts proved fruitless. And so in the hustle and the bustle of Madrid, driven by sheer desperation, the father resorted to placing an ad in the local newspaper, hoping to find his long lost son. And here's what the ad said. Paco, his son's name. Meet at Hotel Montana noon, Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. The father prayed that maybe the boy would see the ad and maybe, just maybe, he he would come to Hotel Montana. On Tuesday, the father, in Ernest Hemingway's story, arrived at Hotel Montana and he could not believe his eyes. A group of police officers had been called out to, to keep order among the 800 young boys named Paco. And they had all come to meet their father in front of Hotel Montana. 800 boys named Paco read the ad in the newspaper and hoped it was for them. 800 Pacos came to receive the forgiveness they so desperately needed. I'm not 100% sure why you're here this morning. What the reason was, maybe someone invited you Maybe you saw it on social media. Maybe you're just a regular. You love Rooted, this is home for you. But what I want you to know is that an ad has been placed. And that ad is from our Father in heaven. And he says, I love you more than you could ever imagine. And I forgive you. And I want to restore our relationship. I want you so close to me that you can can smell my breath. And the only way that that is possible is through my son, Jesus Christ. And so the ad says, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, surrender to him. And so if that's you this morning, I want you to know that 
there's an opportunity for you to surrender your life to Jesus because He loves you more than you could ever imagine. He set His eyes on the cross. And all you have to do is, is say, I surrender it. I surrender my life to you. That's how simple it is. And so eyes closed, heads bowed. If that's you this morning, all you have to simply do is just raise your hand and go, you know what, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna relationship with Jesus. I wanna surrender it all to Jesus. I, I've been living as if I am a Christian, but I'm not, but I, I'm in desperate need of a savior. I've, I've gone to Bible study, I've gone to church. I know all the stories, but you know what? I have not surrendered my life to him. I do not have a relationship with him. And this is an opportunity for you to say, come Lord, would you come? And then for all those who have been walking with Jesus, but it's been dry, you're discontent, you feel far from Him, you've drifted. Today's an opportunity for you to come back to Him. It's the Holy Spirit that is working in your heart that is saying, come, come back to the Father. Come back to the Father, all is forgiven. It's an opportunity for you to do that as well. And so Father God, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We give you all the glory. Would you do a powerful and mighty work in us in this very moment? Would we not be caught up in the dignity of men, but rather be caught up in our devotion to you? Overwhelm us with your love. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.